Hi again, my name is Carrier, and on behalf of Phoenix One Knowledge Solutions, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar on Introduction to Lean Six Sigma. Please join me also in welcoming our speaker for today, Mr. Ariel Dries. Just a, a show of, um, uh, could, you, uh, could you please help me, um, uh, please, uh, please indicate in your chat box if you can hear me well, if you can see my slides. Okay, could you test your chat box? And uh, please, uh, please indicate in your chat box if you can see, see me and if you can hear my slides. Thank you. Uh, Grace, Paki check if you can see me and you can hear my slides. I just want to make sure. Yes, sir. All clear. Okay, thank you. So, um, but could I have everybody, uh, uh, Grace also, please also expose to me. Could I have everybody just indicate their names and where, what company they're from and where they're based right now? Thank you. Okay, can we in? Anyway, so welcome everyone to our uh, introduction to Lean Six Sigma. My name is Ariel Dries. I'm with, I'm right now partnered with Phoenix One. Uh, and uh, welcome to our introduction to Lean Six Sigma. I'm a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. I'm also a Philippine certified for Six Sigma uh, Experts USA. I've been doing Six Sigma for uh, since 1985. Uh, I was I was one of the first batch of engineers trained in Six Sigma, where where they developed it in Motorola. Uh, so I want as one of the uh, probably the word is not pioneer, one of the original uh, students in Six Sigma. Now, um, probably tonight today you may have questions. I'd like you to uh, make use of your chat box. Feel free to uh, place your questions in the chat box while I'm talking. Uh, you will be muted uh, for purpose of clarity of our audio, but let me know if you have any questions at all uh, through your chat box. And anytime you will be, if, I, if I'm able, I'm, I'll be happy to address your uh, questions if any. Now, today we're going to uh, have the following agenda. Number one is uh, we will talk about operational excellence. Why are we going to talk about operational excellence? Because Lean Six Sigma is all about operational excellence. The reason why you want to implement Lean Six Sigma in your company is the, because you want, uh, you want to have operational excellence. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, sometimes people uh, would ask me, you know, what's the use of Six Sigma? And I would explain to them operational excellence initially because that's the, well, not, probably the end all and be of Lean Six Sigma. Another uh, perspective is this. Uh, normally in Lean Six Sigma, we don't certify the company. We certify the people or the change agents. That is the difference between Six Sigma and ISO. Normally in ISO, you certify the companies as, well, as a whole. But in Lean Six Sigma, what you are certifying and training are the people doing the work. We will train them on the methodologies and the tools on Lean Six Sigma. Okay, let's move on. Why do we need to create operational excellence? Or why do we need Lean Six Sigma? Uh, every day in Africa, uh, a gazelle wakes up and it knows it, out, it must outrun the fastest lion or it will not survive it will be killed. The lion on the other hand uh, knows it in the morning, knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle. If it fails to do that, it will starve to death. So whether you're a lion or a gazelle, uh, your, your mission is to hit the ground running. Believe it or not, even in this um, COVID-19 uh, riddled world right now, we need to hit the ground running. 
probably not physically because we cannot go outside, but mentally we need to be there. Um, it is time for us to reinvent ourselves. Lean Six Sigma is one of those skills that are expected of modern managers to have. People are leaders who lead organizations, uh, that they uh, lead organizations because when you have operational excellence or Lean Six Sigma uh, training or certification, it, it ensures you two things. Number one, you can, you're able to look at problems and are able to solve problems in a methodical manner. Number two, you, you know how to look at data and you are able to make uh, data, uh, data driven decisions. So today uh, is just but a short um, introduction of Six Sigma or Lean Six Sigma and a little bit of operational excellence. Now, it would be a challenge for me because uh, it is hard to put in 30 years of experience into one hour of training. The last time I did this, it, I did a full-blown operational Lean Six Sigma introduction. Uh, it took me about three hours, okay? But today, uh, hopefully we're not gonna lo last that long. We're going to just, I trimmed it down a little bit. So hopefully you can, you can have, um, we can have a uh, more concise yet meaningful discussion. Now again, feel free to place your questions in the chat box. Okay, there was a book, this is a classic book. I, I think this is in the 1990s. It is, uh, it, is it was written by Michael Treacy and Fred Wiersima. And it's, it is a, bo it's a, a classic book on the discipline of market leaders. In this book, the authors look at what are the three main disciplines or value propositions of world-class companies that excel in the industry they have. They observe there are three things that were, uh, that were important, okay? Now, product leadership, customer intimacy, and operational excellence. Now, companies would probably need to focus on one Okay, either product leadership, customer intimacy, or operational excellence, and maintain their respectable position, the other two. So whether, whether or not you're a product leadership company, you still have need to have a little bit of operational excellence to be able to survive. But of these three world-class companies, you focus on one and maintain the two. Okay, to dominate the market. Now, let's talk a little bit about product leadership. There are certain companies that are product leadership driven. They're their, uh, their success is dependent on the type of products or uh, the excellence of their products. Well, by the way, not all companies will have the same focus. And I, I'll tell you, I, you know, I'll, I'll give you some examples in a while. Product leadership uh, are companies that would have their end all be all in, in the innovation of their products. So the focus of product leadership businesses focus on research and development. Example of that is uh, Apple, okay? Another one is Harley Davidson. These are product-driven product driven companies. Their, their success will be mainly on their innovation. Another company will be Samsung. Another company will be some of the tech companies like Cisco. Uh, when, when, uh, because uh, the innovativeness of their products will determine their success. I mean, I say Cisco, Cisco owns what you call WebEx. Uh, they are right now under fire with uh, a platform called Zoom. You know, this is what the platform we're using. Okay, so they are looking at, for, for companies that want to, that are product driven, they need to, uh, they need to focus on research development. Now, there are, product, there are companies, they are, they're key, they're companies uh, that will need to focus on customer intimacy, meaning they're not really product centric, although they have products, but their success is uh, driven more more or less on 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 their intimacy with their customers. The the way they integrate, understand, solve problems in with their customers. They are more or less partners with their customers. Examples of this are IT companies. IT companies would would need to partner closely with their, with their clients, okay? Uh, they need to be the um, main competitive advantage of their clients for them to be successful. So uh, companies like Accenture, IBM, uh, HP 
are solution-based companies. These are service companies and service uh, delivery companies. These are companies that we need to have a uh, customer intimacy focus. Okay, that is that is this is a, another type of company, customer intimacy. Now the question is, how about Apple? Does it mean that they will not be intimate to the customers? Well, Apple and like Harley Davidson would need to have some sort of customer intimacy framework, but that will not be their focus. For as long as they create products that are top of the, uh, top of, uh, the line, uh, innovative for the market, all they need to do is to maintain customer, you know, customer intimacy at a certain level. But companies like IBM, HP, Accenture, these guys would need to sit down with the clients and be intimate with them, understand their process, so they, you know, so they can have a very uh, high customer loyalty. Okay, uh, if you notice these companies that I that I mentioned, they are not probably the cheapest in the market. I mean, like Accenture and IBM would go two, three times their competitors, and yet they're very successful in getting the business. Why? Because they develop in a long time customer intimacy. By the way, um, companies that have good customer intimacy would use Lean Six Sigma tools to be able to do that. But, okay, the third discipline is operational excellence. Operational excellence are companies that would depend on the, uh, the, 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 the level of quality of their product or service, and they would need to cre uh, create value at the lowest price. They also would need to have great and seamless service for the customers. Okay, so the key here in operational excellence is efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency and effectiveness. This is the key for uh, operational excellence. Companies that would need operational excellence are, the first example is a company, I have it in my slide, okay? Um, Amazon. Amazon, their key is uh, a seamless uh, delivery uh, uh, supply chain, okay, seamless ordering system, and their the efficiency of their inventory system. That is that is Amazon's key because they're in the, the internet. What what the customers would want from their from them is efficiency at the lowest possible price. So Amazon needs that. Another type of uh, company that would need to be operationally excellent and would need to focus on operational excellence is Zara. Okay, like I said, Ariel, Zara is a fashion company. It probably needs, a, it should be a product centric company. Yeah, that's true. They need to have good products. But did you know Zara is about fast fashion? What they normally do is they would knock off my designer jeans, designer, designer brands. Like if Gucci comes out with a new design, the strength of Zara is scalping that new design of Gucci, not exactly, but more or less get the trend and should be able to turn out new product within days. Actually, within one week, they always turn around new, new, new types of designs. Normally in fashion, you have four seasons, uh, winter, spring, summer, fall, okay? Yeah, but right now with Zara, they have 52 seasons. So 52 weeks, they would turn around new types of shirts that, would they, that they would need to quote unquote, knock off or copy with the designer brands. They would probably not copy it exactly, but they would get an idea, okay, this is the new trend right now, let's turn around fast. So really, Sara is an operational excellence type of company. Another one are the supply chain companies, um, DB Schenker, um, Air 21, uh, and all these other, you know, DHL, and FedEx, these are supply chain companies that need operational excellence. Okay, they they need to because speed is of the essence. Speed and accuracy of uh, transactions are of the essence. Another one is BPO. BPO would need to be operational excellence. But what? Because why is that? Because they would be BPO really just um, create BPO and shared services would 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 create processes that would be more efficient than the in-house processes of the clients. Example, BPOs that, that uh, service, um, uh, service uh, 
finance and uh, purchasing functions, they would be they they would need to make their process more efficient, less waste, okay, at the lowest price. Okay. Now BPO. Another one is BPO would create a, a higher sense of value uh, outside outside of the outside of having what you call labor arbitrage. The BPOs would be able to create that value through operational excellence. So, kailangan efficient, fast, and low price. Now, operational excellence was really pioneered by manufacturing. Manufacturing, especially high-tech manufacturing, which, which is the word I originally came from, eventually evolved to BPO, IT, and all that. But manufacturing, high-tech manufacturing is where uh, Lean Six Sigma started to, to flourish. Uh, automotive, etc. Manufacturing would need to produce products at the lowest cost, at the fastest pace, okay, at predictable, at predictable uh, rates. Okay, the, the, this is key to uh, to be successful in in uh, in operation excellence companies. It used to be, I used to work for Motorola. Uh, I worked for Motorola for more than 13 years. I was one of the first batch of those exposed in Six Sigma. Eventually, I will move from one company to another. Um, the, the key here is this. Um, in, in manufacturing, yes, we do have designs, but as designs of electronics would, would, uh, would, would age in their life cycle, the price would commoditize. Para electronics, you know, if you have your iPhone, probably your iPhone of the same, let's say iPhone 10. Five years from now, your iPhone 10 will not be the same price. The prices tend to go down. So the name of the game is efficiency. The name of the game is being able to produce the same amount of volume for the same product at a lower cost. Because why? Because the cost of electronics goes down. Let me tell you something. Consumer products, also the same. Like Tide and Surf and all these guys, it's a cutthroat type of industry. They either need to upgrade their product or be able to to manufacture at a very low cost. Okay, now in the Philippines, okay, outsourcing, outsourcing in the Philippines is a big thing. Okay, so even even if we are in ECQ, uh, outsourcing is one of those that were extent was produced was was judged to be essential. Why? Because it's huge business for the Philippines. Being world class globally. Um, excellence in everything is that battle cry of operational excellence. Okay, so that is operational excellence. Operational excellence is the execution of business strategy more consistently and reliably than the competition with lower operational risks, with higher quality, lower operating costs, and increased revenues relative to its competitor. So that is the essence of, of operational excellence. Now, there are four building blocks of operational excellence. One is strategy deployment. Another one is performance management. Number three is process excellence. And number four is high-powered teams. So when you talk about operational excellence, it's not just process excellence. It has something to do with being able to know what's important to your company, strategy deployment. Is it, are you going to be a product leadership company? Are you going to be a customer intimacy company? Or are you going to be a... Uh, operational excellence company okay and 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 part of that is uh, getting to uh, getting to know what your your strategy map what is your strategy roadmap and balance scorecards have something to do with this which is connected with number two which is performance management okay at this point since we're gonna focus on Lean Six Sigma I'm gonna take, talk a little bit about process excellence in high power teams now Process excellence is about designing a seamless, efficient process that would result in world-class results. And that, that is what we want. Being world-class is really the, um, is the clarion call right now that is very, uh, that is very essential for, for all companies right now, especially in the Philippines. Uh, if you've heard of ASEAN integration, that's just start of it. If you want to compete worldwide, uh, guess what? You need to be world class. Even if you have a global company, let's say you have a um, multinational company and you're a shared service in the Philippines. 
I have, I have something to tell you. Your competition, yes, is the competition of your company. But many times, even your competition is a competition within your company. Meaning, if you have a, if you have a facility in India, and your facility in the Philippines, and your facility in Malaysia, guess what? Your competition as a shared service group would be Malaysia of the same company in India. Because the guys who would perform better would have a very good cost model will be, will, will win where the business would go. So uh, the amount of business or the amount of work you're going to draw will depend primarily on the quality of your work, how seamless your work, how efficient, and how world-class is your work. Now, these are the different components of, of, uh, of companies who would li like to have process excellence. They need to have team-based problem solving. They need to have comm commitment to continuous improvement. Okay? They need to have commitment to business process management and they need to have a business execution system. Now, I have, I have news for you. Lean Six Sigma, methodology and culture, actually already, uh, you know, uh, gives a check mark, tick mark, uh, already provides all these other four aspects above. If you implement a Lean Six Sigma methodology culture, you will have team-based problem solving. You will have a framework that will allow you to, be, to have continuous improvement and it will allow you to have a business process management process and, and it will facilitate you having a business execution system. So Lean Six Sigma, for you to have process excellence is a good, safe methodology on how to do that. Now, if you're in this, in this uh, webinar and you ask yourself, how do we have Six Sigma? Okay, the first thing is this, you need to have yourself trained, you need to have yourself the managers equipped with background of how, how Six Sigma, uh, you know, falls into your the reason why I started the operational excellence because of my 30 years experience, you know, in understanding of operational excellence will eventually lead you on how to lead you to the framework. Okay. So Lean Six Sigma is, will help you with process excellence. Now, Sabina, I think we're not ready for Six Sigma, but training you, you can be ready. All you need, you what you need are change agents. And I'm going to talk about the chose change agents in a while. But the best practice I've seen uh, of those who would implement Lean Six Sigma are the following. Standardized process. Business process management system. If it's automated, the better. But you need a standardized process. Okay, And that is why uh, part of OPEX is to be able to create that standardized process. When you train people in six, Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt, the tools that we train people is to how to create standardized process, document the process, etc. Okay, the next level is you need to implement a culture of Kaizen. Kaizen is called continuous improvement. Kaizen is more really of a mindset, a culture of trying to have everybody have the same mentality. Lean and Kaizen are really I really want you know our kaizen is the beginning of lean okay kaizen i just wanted to separate it because you can start off with something very very simple some concepts like eight ways come some concepts like 5s some concepts uh, like workplace organization the, uh, having a mentality of uh, fixing things that are are not are, are not uh, does not look right when something is wrong fix it right away that is the culture of kaizen in the culture of of, um, of suggesting of suggesting improvements in your company, we're gonna talk about that in a while. So the first one is kaizen, the next one is lean. Lean is all about removing waste, and we will in lean normally we will talk about levers on how to reduce waste. Uh, lean is a qualitative approach. Then after you've set it up, now is the time to create a framework of reducing variation, uh, being able to measure what you do and reduce the, uh, reduce the work and all that. This, this is the realm of Six Sigma. This is Lean Six Sigma. 
Okay? So initially, you will have a standardized process. Eventually, it will have a graduated flow of Lean Six Sigma. If you notice the, if you, if you look at the, the uh, illustration on your slide, uh, it tells their BPMS, Kaizen, Lean, Lean Six Sigma. On the left side is, is the CMMI uh, maturity model of uh, maturity model organizations. So there is, you know, there is a lot of parallelism in as far as uh, implementing CMMI and Lean Six Sigma or operational excellence. Okay, so you're, you come from chaotic. When you don't have a standardized process, that's chaotic. When you have a standardized process, it's repeatable. When you are, when you, when you have a Kaizen, you start to define the standards, the principles on how you're going to work. Manage is when you're, when you have a organization in your place. Optimize is when you're going on to continuous improvement. Okay. Now, number four component of operational excellence are high powered teams. High powered teams are, um, are, are group, uh, group uh, teams, uh, small group activities that eventually will cascade, uh, uh, cascade the culture, problem solving culture to the whole organization. That is, that is, uh, that, that is the spirit behind lean leadership and get back Kaizen. So if you want to have high powered teams, the culture of lean and game by Kaizen is, is one of the components that will help you have high power teams. Okay. So, so it's all about being able to work in normal problem solving teams. Okay. The, when I start, when we started in, in Motorola and Six Sigma, we did not have belts. We did not have certification. We did have trainings, but this is where we started. When small groups started to sit down and talk about their problems and solve their problems, we would use ordinary tools, simple tools in Lean and Six Sigma to help solve our problems. The most important thing is we talk about the problem. And the most important thing is we open our eyes to what could be the problem. Okay. And then when we started doing that, that is the, the, the start of progress. Um, High power teams will give you the right culture, right mindset, right attitude, right competencies. Now there is a um, maturity model in teams as well. Now, one of the one of the big, um, well, memorable memorable experience I had when we had when we did high power teams is when we were in Motorola. We had a department where in their groups have the the highest yield, the lowest defect rates, uh, the best quality worldwide of the same product line. And we're talking about worldwide. And, and they have the fastest cycle time, meaning their delivery, on-time delivery is 100%. They're world-class world -class department. Their products are world-class. Um, and uh, they're best in class in all categories. Uh, you know, the the important the, the striking thing about this group is that all these all their depart all their sections they in all their uh, production lines they had no supervisors they had no leads they were a self-directed team meaning and these are like high school operators these are most of them are ladies we have some technicians most of the technicians were men it doesn't matter what the gender is but it's both mixed men and women they they were rank and file employees and they had no supervisors. They had no leads. They would have leadership rotated. They were a self-directed team. Okay. And eventually that, that model became the model for the whole entire factory. It was amazing how they were able to do that. So they started with small team activities, creating the right culture. Okay. And it starts with the leader. It starts with the leader walking the walk, walking the talk. That is what the gem, Gemba Kaizen is. It's the Gemba means uh, working, uh, walking the workplace, and it starts with the leader. Okay, now let's talk about lean. Okay, so anabay in lean. No? Lean is very is, is implementable in all areas in manufacturing, offices, services, supply chain, IT, outsourcing, construction, human resources, etc., etc., etc. You know, you don't need to have a um, to have a, by the way, you don't need to have a, a college degree, okay? 
uh, let me tell you a story. We had th that team that was self-directed team with the best quality worldwide. Most of the teams there were, were, were imported to the U.S., exported to the U.S. to present because they were, they were winning competitions. Uh, their average, their average um, education attainment was high school graduates. So many of them were not college, were not, college, were not even college level, they were high school graduates. Okay? We even had a team that, were, uh, uh, that was an old janitor team. They send that team to the U.S. Okay, and now imagine. Do, do let me ask you a question. Did janitors do janitors study statistics? No, but they use the tools that were simple and applicable to them. So uh, one of the reasons why I I went to consulting and focused on Lean Six Sigma is because I had the impression that most people think Six Sigma is a some sort of a you know, you need to be, it's like a religion and you need to study uh, high class math. And well, that is true. When you go to black belt, you need to study statistics. But it does not mean you, if you do not have black belts in your office, you cannot implement Lean Six Sigma in your office. Okay. All you need to do is apply the tools that are applicable in your, in your organization. And that, that, because you don't start with the, the complicated stuff. You, most of the Lean Six Sigma improvements start from things that are basic in nature, okay? Although eventually when you're, as your company goes more sophisticated, you probably would need a few people to know some of more, the more advanced statistical tools, uh, especially. But as a start, you know, if you're an SME, a small medium enterprise here, you can start off with Lean Six Sigma with the basic tools. Because uh, just remember, you know, we started, when we started this thing in Motorola, it was, it was basically uh, our, our machine operators that started this. Eventually, it, it moved to, and by the way, Toyota has the same, uh, the same, uh, the same experience. Now, so applicability of Lean is in this in much, much more. What is lean? Well, I'd like to I'd like to ask you a question. When was the last time you had your okay? Now five years ago. When you have your passport, you probably do to stay to have your passport in you. Eventually you know, I think some they did something good. I think uh, even four, four years ago, more than four years ago, actually, they started the, uh, such that they removed the batch processing. They involved the malls and they, they followed actually some principles of lean, like a single piece flow, plani, uh, hijonka, uh, they know their capacity. Such that if you're, they will require you to plan out your appointment. That day you have to go there. You can go in there anytime. You just get your ticket and go there. Okay, no organization. Now you have to set your appointment. Okay, when your when your appointment is set, they know the time you're gonna go in. And if you're if you're if you're uh, for 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 agencies that were in the malls, it would take you. 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes max. Okay, I uh, a few years back I had to go to Vietnam. I had a very um, quick trip to Vietnam, I, and I needed to, you know, I did, was not able to plan ahead too much. So I needed to go to Palawan to to have my passport uh, renewed. And guess what? You know, uh, that was quite expensive because I needed a uh, thing, but I didn't mind. So. It was good to take a break in Palawan, but I was able to renew my passport in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Mas matagal pa yung pagpunta ko plan. Okay? Uh, when you go to Asiana in in uh, Pasay, it used to be batch processing. Uh, it would take you, it was a little bit better than the one in Ross Boulevard. It, it took, it will take you for four hours. Now, I think they're now 
down to one arm or less, okay? Which means they also improve their process. Now, that is what Lean could do for your company. Now, I don't know if you guys are, uh, if you guys are, um, you've watched um, a Formula One racing. In Formula One racing, there is one, there is one objective when you watch a Formula One race. You want to see fast cars, right? Okay. And the drivers who drive the cars, their, their goal is to be able to win. Okay. In Formula One racing, there are two types of uh, activities. Number one is when they're driving the car. That is your value added process. Another one is when they do a pit stop. The pit stop is a non value added process. Okay. It could be a waste. Siya. Pero you cannot, they cannot race because they cannot afford to not have a pit stop because they'll run out of gas, you'll run out of gas and you'll run out of, uh, and probably your tires will wear out and you'll lose, lose the race. Although it's a non-value added process, it's an essential non-value added. Nag-gets ba? Parang, parang dito sa ating, ano, sa COVID-19 uh, problem, you know? Sino pinalalabas lang? Yung mga essential workers. That is what Lean does. It asks you, ano ba essential? Okay? Now, I'm gonna show you a video, hopefully maganda yung audio natin and video, of how the pit stop transitioned in the 1950s to the year 2000s. Okay? And I'd like you to just don't blink, especially pagdating sa year 2000. Tignan nyo yung nangyayari. This is a Formula 1 pit stop in 1950. Indianapolis, but Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's the tenth time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. in your chat box uh, what do you think was the difference between the 1950s and the I think 2013 1950 it took more than 50 minutes 50 seconds to have a pit stop okay and uh, lately right now the pit stops are less than three seconds what was uh, what was the difference could you place in your chat box please manpower count yeah, yeah, well, thank you for that technology used. Use mechanical tools, yes. Advanced tools, okay, technology. Okay, that's right. Pero, let me tell you about something about manpower, Roel. Even if, in the 1950s, they added the same number of people in that, in that setup, you probably will still, you probably end up having a longer pit stop. Okay, so it, it's it's not just the manpower. So notice they 
created, they demarcated they, they the process. So, yung sinabi ni Nick uh, and Gera, the process is there. And of course, they're gonna use uh, advanced tools, okay? But see, the tools are, are, are incidental when you analyze the process. Am I making sense? Okay? Kung yung process mo, you define the process, then you can add people. Itong problema kasi sa mga, you know, as I, as I go, you know, watch TV right now or process as a government, well, you know, it's no re not really everybody, any, anybody's fault. Many times, the reason why the process or the results are inefficient, here's the problem. We don't have a good process. Okay? So the first thing is you need to find the process properly. Remove the waste or re reduce the waste. Then you define how many people you need and the types of tools you need. Probably the tools will come first before the people. But the first thing is process. Okay? Kasi miskina, I, I have all the tools in 1950 and I added people. If you, you don't really look at the process properly, you end up with, with the longer pit stop. Okay? So that is what lean is all about. That is how lean looks like. So what is lean? Lean is methodology that improves business performance using simple practical tools. Even if, if you really notice yung technology kanina to sa pit stop, it's not really advanced technology, although, you know, the high power, you know, high power torque wrench, yung mga nila, yeah, it's relative to 1950s, mas mataas ang technology, but, you know, it's not, many times lean is about using practical tools. Simple technique to enhance quality cost. It's about studying the process. What they did, what we do in Lean is we expose and eliminate waste. Okay? Ano ba yung mga waste natin? In the system to increase velocity of the process. So, importante is eliminate the waste and improve the velocity. Next is we want to eliminate everything that's not add value to the customer's eyes. Okay? That, that is, you know, what Lean is. Ano ba yung value ng customer's eyes? Kasi many, many times, many times ang nangyayari sa atin ito, okay? We let the controls dictate the process. Pero, if you really look at it, you want to identify first, sino ba customer dito? Okay? Sino ba customer dito? Pag siya, ito yung customer ko, this is my customer. Okay. To the customer's eyes, what is the value? In this case, in the Formula 1 example, a customer mo is the driver. The driver wants to win the race. So to him, what is value? To him, value is the car is continuously running. Na gets yo? So if he, he really looks at it, the value that is created by the pit stop, every time it is stopped, it is non-value added. Although the pit stop is a value enabling process, but the, the lesser, the more efficient that is, that is better for me. Kaya what they did is create, look at the, ano ba yung activities sa pit stop that are non-value added. Kaya nga doon, nung soft 1950s, uh, could you, could, if you, if you really look at it, ano yung mga, na, mga, mga waste doon sa pit stop nung sa 1950s? Could you, could you, uh, could you indicate in your chat box? Ano yung mga waste? Sige na. Let's have some uh, some uh, some participation. What were the wastes during the 1950s speed stop? Wiping the windshield, very good. Ano pa? Windshield cleaning, ano pa? You know, did you notice? Yung isang tao siya yung magkakabit ng siya yung magkakabit ng gulong, siya pa yung magpupukpok, siya pa yung, mag, yung magtatayten, you know? Giving water to the driver. So notice, may, may, may panahon pa, getting the spare time. So you had to wait for that. So all of those were ways, waiting pa. Pagdating, tsaka palang kukunin yung code, yung, yung tire, tatanggalin, etc. So notice, driver taking a call, tama. Getting the spare time. All that is true. That, that, that really delays it. The 2013 model, you know, pagdating ng kotse, nandiyan na yung tire, sasalpak na, may tatanggal, split second. May sasakpak, may taga, may taga, ano, and it's all synchronized. It's like a ballet. Okay? Okay? Now, 
So, the clean is also change in thinking in the culture in the organization. Okay? I'm sorry. Sorry, Archimedes. I apologize. I didn't realize uh, we had the international audience. So, we had a change in organization. Every, everybody, you know, in, in the 2013 model, uh, everything is ready. By the, time, by the time the pit stop is there, somebody places the tire, uh, removes the tire, places the tire, all in synchronized fashion. Okay? Now, but more importantly, lean is all about culture. Lean is all about culture. Changing in thinking and uh, the culture. The culture of the 1950s pit stop are different. They had to change that mentality. Because every time there is a delay, they can, win the, they can lose the race just because of a pit stop. So the pit stop has become a, a um, how should I say this, a competitive advantage to the driver, to their customer. The same thing with our, with our organization. Now, uh, we come from a very diverse, I, I reviewed the, the panel list, okay, and we come from a very diverse audience right now. Uh, can we, can I just have a, sh can I, uh, can we have a show of, um, uh, can, can you show, could you please indicate in your chat box, what is your, uh, what is your, um, what is your company, what is your line of business, and could you indicate who are your customers? Okay. Could you type in the, your customer, who are your customers? Embassy, okay. Public immigration, IT, uh, okay. IT BPO insurance company, Ray. welcome. Digital agencies, etc. Okay. Canadian exporters to the Philippines, okay. Uh, a Bureau of Customs importer exporters, welcome. To the Bureau of Customs. I know you have a problem right now because of this COVID thing. Healthcare, wow, welcome. Hospitals and patients. Okay, so I think it is clear to you who your customers are. So Lean is all about identifying your customers, identifying the the ways that are that are uh, that are impeding your output to your customers. Eliminate all the ways that uh, does not add value to the customer size. Things that the customer that does does not really pay for. And the last one are the use of practical tools. In uh, Lean, Lean and Six Sigma uh, actually identifies those tools. Now, I want to talk, talk to you about in the history of Lean. Lean really started, well, it's, it's, uh, it was started, it was, most of the credit was given to to Toyota, which is true because they, they perfected Lean. It is based on the Toyota productive system. We have one book here, Toyota Way by Liker, and there's another one, the machine that changed the world. That was the foundation of Lean. However, it actually started with the Industrial Revolution when uh, Henry Ford, when Henry Ford uh, created the first assembly line and and they created the first mass-produced car. They were in a car. It used to be cars were handmade, brick and mortar type, so that only the rich people can afford cars. And that that's the thing. What what uh, Henry Ford did was he evaluated the process, uh, segmented the process, designed the process such that it was. It has some continuous, some semblance of continuous flow, and that was the start of Lean. Lean is all about continuous flow. Uh, so when the the war broke, uh, when the war was finished, uh, Gerald Douglas MacArthur was uh, commissioned by United States government, uh, the President of the United States, to help rebuild Japan. And Douglas MacArthur made it together with his uh, with his advisors and his and upon discussion with the president. They decided to rebuild the manufacturing of Japan, and uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur uh, uh, brought in the technocrats from the U.S. 
Uh, among them was um, W. Edwards Deming, who was the guru of quality. He was already a guru of quality, known to be a respected figure in quality circles and a data scientist at that uh, in, in the U.S. However, when he came to Japan, the Japanese actually listened to him more than the Americans. And that normally happens. We, we take for granted people who are always there. Okay. And when Deming went to Japan, they were, the Japanese took to heart everything that he taught. They even brought the, the guys from Toyota to, to the Ford Motors to study Ford Motors. And they were amazed. But they found some lapses in the, this process design and some of the practices of Ford. And they created their own Toyota productive system. Okay. And, and that was the start of uh, Toyota Productive and Lean. So, uh, if you look at the timeline, Taichi Ono started TPS in 1950s, and compared to the compared to manufacturing, uh, car manufacturing of the U.S., there you know the uh, Toyota was a dwarf. Okay, they're you know they're very small. Okay, uh, the big three still dominated GM, uh, Ford Motors, and Chrysler. Uh, but as the Japanese, and I talk about the Japanese, not just Toyota, started to listen to the teachings of Edward Deming, they started to dominate manufacturing. They took over steel manufacturing worldwide, electronics, appliances, and the car, and the car industry. To date, Toyota is still number one. Well, there was a time Honda was number one, then Toyota was number one. Today, worldwide, Toyota is number one. And and Toyota, Toyota's Toyota productive system has become the uh, benchmark for, for manufacturing, automotive manufacturing, and the implementation of Lean. They call it Lean. Okay. What is, what is Toyota's uh, philosophy? World, uh, provide world-class quality and service. That's their vision. They want to do, involve people, employee, employee, develop employee potential through mutual trust and cooperation. Actually, when if you review some of their values, uh, a couple of words struck me. Okay, uh, humble leadership. So that is part of their uh, part of their uh, leadership philosophy in Toyota. Humble leadership. Okay, so the, the bosses would go to the production floor, to the floor, to the. And ask, okay, ask, process, they recognize that their that their customers are king because they are, they live and breathe because of the customers, okay, very customer centric. Reduce cost to elimination of waste. So they, I will be teaching today a framework on how do you uh, how do you um, recognize waste. And they develop a flexible production system that can respond to changes in the market. That is uh, agile. Lean processes are agile in nature. They, their, their focus is continuous flow. Okay. The birth of lean, the term lean, the product, the Toyota production system, were, was called lean uh, at the birth of this book. Okay. Yung, uh, the machine that changed the world by James Womack, Daniel jo Jones, and Daniel Roos. Okay, they talked about, they coined the term lean system. Okay, lean system. Okay, and, uh, and eventually lean became a buzzword in, in manufacturing. They call it lean manufacturing, lean services. There's even lean offices and lean operations. Okay, there's also lean IT. Some people are teaching lean IT. Now, these are the first uh, early adopters of Lean, uh, aside, outside of, uh, uh, of Toyota, obviously where Lean came from. Lockheed Martin, Intel, Texas Instruments, and NIT. But now, if you look at most of the uh, Fortune 200 companies, most of them claim to have Lean Six Sigma or Lean Six Sigma methodologies in place. Why? Because they want operational excellence. So I'm going to talk about 
Lean is a principle-centered framework or uh, process. If you ask me one word to describe Lean, it is culture. Cool. That culture is described in five principles. Number one is defined value. Okay. What is defined value? When you talk about value, you talk about, you specify value from the end customer's perspective. Okay, so that is value. What is the end customer's perspective? Okay. So whether you're, you're in manufacturing, you are in hospitals, you are in the embassy, you're in government, you need to look at the value of what you're doing from the perspective of the customers, the ones who's paying for your service or the one you're serving bottom line okay so that is value from the customer's perspective now next you have to understand what value is value is what the customer is willing to pay for in bpos it's easier especially if a third party bpo like convert converges or you know uh and uh teleperformance and all they have this term called you know is that task chargeable Okay, what does that mean? If the task you're doing is not being paid for by the customer, then that's non-value added process. Okay. It, is, it should be a process that the customers are willing to pay for. So in BPOs, it's an advantage because literally the customer pays only for the task that, are, that's, that is of value. They normally would negotiate and typically, you know, typically they would they would segmentize all the process steps and from the process steps, they will identify what, what are the value added processes, the non-value added process and the value enabling process. Okay. Now, in defining value, you want the right product or service at the right time, at the right quantity, right quality at the right price in accordance to what the customer requires. Okay. So that is defined value. Customer's perspective, Next is what is the customer willing to pay for at the right time, quality, quantity. Okay, the next one is you have to map out the, uh, the value stream. So you know what value is. You need to identify and map out the value stream. Okay, you want to trace the value of the process. Example, if you're, if you're uh, ordering uh, hamburgers from... Jollibee, okay. Uh, lately, we've not been uh, able to go to restaurants, only take out, take away, please. In Jollibee, uh, when, 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 when the guys at the kitchen would uh, cook the patty, that is value-added process, right? So, so you, 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 you trace the value when they cook the, uh, when they cook the patty, place the bun, okay? and you incorporate it in a workflow that is called the value stream map. You're actually tracing the flow of the value. Now, when you do a value stream map, you will also be able to identify which, which of the processes or activities that are non-value added. Example, when they count the number of patties, when they move from one place to another, those are non-value added processes, okay? Typically in Lean, you want to look at value stream maps to create, to be able to, to identify what are the, uh, what are the non-value added. So this is an example of value stream map. Oh, for obvious reasons, we will not go through all of the details, but in a value stream map, this is a, this is a ticketing service. Okay. At the right side is your customer. Okay. Upper right. Now, what they do, okay, you have incoming tickets at the upper left side and you will have three SAs, okay. Uh, the SAs uh, will process the tickets initially and it goes to SA4 in batches, goes to junior SA1, go to junior SA2, then supervisor. So no, normally you have, so you have one, two, three, four, five, five levels of, of uh, process, okay. So in the value stream map, you will be able to identify how, how much resources are being utilized. Notice at the bottom of the, um, at the bottom, you'll have the cycle time, uptime, shift, okay? And, 
and notice the uh, the indicators there. You have the yellow indicators. It tells you where the wastes are, like inflexibility of two SAs. Motion has has to walk to drop off the cards, waiting batches of four. And normally those are the wastes that were identified. This is what this is normally what we do in lean. Uh, if you notice this graph, when you study how it, it goes, you'll be able to identify in a non-technical way where the wastes are. Okay? The, green, the green indicators are your suggestions okay? uh, in, in, on how to fix the problem in the process. So this is called a value stream map. This is one of the more powerful tools in, uh, in Lean. Okay, so that's a principle. So first, identify what value is, trace the value stream, because when you trace the value stream, you'll be able to identify right away where the, where the wastes are. Next, you need to create flow. What is flow? Flow is after removing the waste, ensure that the flow runs smoothly. You want to create continuous flow. That is a principle of Lean. We use normally levers of Lean to create non uh, to create to create, non, uh, non, uh, to create continuous flow. We want to reduce non-value adding process. Uh, non -value, you want to remove or reduce the non-value adding activities and create continuous flow. Now, number four is establishing pool. What is pool? We want to limit inventory to, uh, to smoothen the flow of work. In inventory is not just, well, for manufacturing it's obvious. Inventory are the raw materials. Okay, in warehousing, the inventory is raw materials. But for service delivery, what is inventory? It is the amount of unfinished work. Okay, in your, in your email, your inbox is your inventory. In your system, your incoming applications, the paperwork that is incoming is your inventory. Okay, we want to establish pool. Uh, customer de demands that dictates that they, it now, in Lean, you need to have, we have a term called tap time. What we want to do is we create, to create a rhythm, a rhythm, continuous flow rhythm. Tap time dictates the demand of the process. For example, if somebody's here from customs, let's say uh, every month you have one, 1,000 ship, uh, let's say, let's have, the, let's do a simple math. You have 3,000 shipments coming in every month. Okay, the tack time is divided by the amount of time. Let's just imagine uh, 30 days a week, uh, 30 days a month, sorry. So uh, 3,000 divided by 30, what is that? Okay, so one, you need to be able to do 100 transactions per day. That is your tack time. Meaning you need to create your process such that you can you can, you can actually meet the tap time. Okay? That, is, that is part of an establishing pool system. Establishing what is the tap time as demanded by the customer and create a process that will establish pool system, not push. Uh, it's it's demand-based uh, process that will allow you to create continuous flow. Okay? Now, how are you going to do that? You use the levers uh, that we use in Lean. Number five is pursue perfection. What does it mean? Pursue perfection means it's continuous improvement. Part of Lean is to have a culture of continuous improvement. You are never done with, you are never done with, uh, with work. There's always room for, for improvement. The total employee, leaders, and associates participation in Kaizen practices. Everybody has a suggestion, okay? We have normally, um, Normally, Kaizen companies, lean companies, have a Kaizen culture. They have a suggestion program. Just imagine if you have 200 employees, or let's say 100 employees, and each employee has one good suggestion every single month. So it means you have 100 suggestions every single month. In a year, how many suggestions is that? Okay. That's 1,200 suggestions each month, each year. So in, just imagine if you have that power. Now, normally, 
the Japanese were good at this, especially Toyota and even companies like Mazda in the olden days. No, uh, the Japanese normally in their statistics is they're able to implement sixty percent of their good suggestions. Sixty percent. American companies. Well, I used to work for a lot of American companies. I worked for American companies almost all my working life. American companies, their statistics only ten percent. So that's why. The, in as far as Kaizen is concerned, the Japanese companies were more were more effective because they're able to leverage the brain power of of people. Once we're not we're not listening or not proactively asking our guys to to suggest improvements, then we're not utilizing. That is a waste. They are not utilizing their talent. So normally you would have a suggestion program, and we would have an infrastructure. For that suggestion program and people who like to suggest we give them token uh, token prices here's the thing for a person the best reward is to see their suggestion implemented okay now there are three types of work actually there are different frameworks of the type of work like I choose choose this one this is very simple there's value-added work there is non-value added work and business value added work. Okay. Another framework is if you look at your process, you have core processes, which is your value added work, non core processes, but essential, which is business value add, and you have your frustration process, which is their non value added work. Okay. Now, when you talk about value added work, it is activity that it is, these are activities or processes that add value to the product or process. Meaning it is part of your core, okay? This is what the customer is uh, is um, is asking from you. So you can use this framework from a macro perspective and even from a micro perspective, okay? So if you're a CEO here, you probably can look at it from a macro perspective, you know? Uh, we were, you know, some colleagues of mine were uh, analyzing a big company, I will not mention what industry you know right away. Uh, they were analyzing uh, this big company's um, processes and, and they, had, they had on payroll about 300 doctors. They don't have any HMO. They had 300 doctors. And that's not their business. They are not, they're not medical city. So they, they have in payroll, hospital, it's a, they have a huge non-value added. Am I making sense? So, um, so value added are processes that your customers will pay for. You're known for that, okay? From a macro, micro perspective, you're looking at each activity, okay, this, does this activity changes the form, fit, and function? Of the process like if you look at it from a hamburger standpoint the value added processes of creating a, a hamburger is when I cook the bun I cook the uh, cook the patty okay prepare the bun and play, uh, place the patty in the bun and probably wrap it because the customer expects it. And that's it. All the other processes are non-value added. Okay. So what are non-value added process? Uh, process changes the form, fit, and function of the product or service. And if it's not changed in that way, then it's probably non-value added process. So it's a form of a waste. So you will have two types of waste if you ask me. One is incidental waste. You know, since you have rework and all that. And another form of waste is institutional waste. Because it's part of your work instruction. But you have to do it because, you know, it was defined. Okay? But if you really look at it, it is not, it was not, it was not, uh, it's not being, um, it's, it's, it does not add value to the customer. The customer does not pay for it. There's another type of non-value added. It is called business value add. It's also non-value add, but these are required by the government. 
the regulators or the reg and the shareholders. Example, if I buy a, a hamburger from Jollibee, okay, the activity of giving me the hamburger after paying for it is value add. However, the activity of giving the receipt to me may not be necessary for me because I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a corporation. I don't really care about the invoice, but the government of the Philippines requires Jollibee to uh, to give the to give the invoice, and and also part of their standards of internal control for their shareholders and their accounting system is to create is to give an invoice. So if it's if it's if it's required by the finance department as a control and it's required by the government. It could be it's a business value add or sometimes it's called operational value add. It's a form of non-value add, but it's, it's a necessary non-value add. Okay. In my experience, 20% of the processes I've seen, initial processes, are value added, especially in traditional companies. Okay. Uh, normally, uh, this is where the interesting discussion. I normally would have a process mapping exercise with my class. And people tend to defend their process and say, no, no, this is value add, this is value add, this is value add. But, you know, part of the exercise when you do a lean class is to actually scrutinize which is non-value add. Now, when you identify non-value added process, it does not mean you remove them right away. Okay, I have to make that clarification. Because there is, if there is a reason why the process, the activity is there. So part of the process is to, okay, is to analyze, okay, what can I do to either eliminate, reduce, or replace a process? Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the, where, the, where the activities lie when you do a lean activity. So these are, in the historically, manufacturing sectors would have 85% non-value added process services sector 75 percent so if you're right now you've not implemented lean yet you may want to take a look at your process steps your actual as is process now create a you know create a flow chart of what's actually going on your process and i challenge you to 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 analyze each one which of these processes are value added and non-value added okay nba these are examples of non-value added uh, tasks. Proofreading. Oh, I need to proofread because it's non-value. I'm not saying you remove proofreading when you're preparing documents. It's just that you you know the more time you the more the more that you proofread it means it's a more non-value. It's a form of inspection or rework. Counting amount of work is non-value add. Inspection and checking. Again. It does not mean if you're inspecting your product or your service, you will remove this tomorrow because non-value add. No, I'm just saying, you know, it does not add to the form, fit, and function of the service or product. So you need, you need to, you know, you need to be able to figure out how do I maintain my quality with by by reducing the type of inspection. Uh, sometimes it's you can have a statistical sampling which is better than 100% inspection because inspection is never really, um, never really effective, that effective. Again, you, you need to do a study on that one. Okay, because quality is not inspected in, it is in built in and designed into your process. That is what quality is. Now, let's look, look at uh, sorting of work. Okay, that's not value and logging information. Does it drive you, especially if you have a, we have a foreigners in, in the Philippines, it drives you crazy when you go to a facility, you have to log in to, to the log book in the guard. You go to the lobby, you still log in. You go to the lobby of the office upstairs, you still log in. I mean, that, that's one of the biggest waste, non-value added activities I've seen. Of course, you need security. But, you know, if you think about it, you know, that is only for traceability. There are, more efficient ways to do that, okay? Now, another one is uh, checking calculations. Again, especially when you do uh, like Excel spreadsheets and all that, 
non-value added, especially when you're moving back and forth. Rework, obviously, is, is non-value add. Another type is moving, moving and setup, monitoring work, stamping, okay? Any type of rework, working, waiting in a queue, yeah. In the Philippines, we have a lot of those, waiting in a queue. Every time we wait, especially now with the new normal, uh, social distancing, it's going to be an issue. Uh, another one is excessive approvals. I'm being kind here. You know, if you look at in the book, non-value added is approval. Every time that you add signatories in your document, it is non-value added. This is what I at, at the point in time when we had the power crisis, 50 signatures. That's a lot of signatures. We have to have all people that the more inefficient. Okay. And once you start designing your process around the controls, okay, that mentality is going to multiply and you'll have a very inefficient process because it will multiply exponentially. You want to design the process from the perspective of the customer, then place the controls in between. That would probably be a better way to do it than just, you know, than, than, than centering everything on the controls. Although it depends on, on the industry, especially for banks, they, uh, I was working, doing play some training for a, a multinational bank a shared service here, and all they do is for this is a balance sheet. So they, they're more interested in the, uh, that's a little bit of a diff, uh, different scenario because their customer is the regulator. Okay? But even then, you know, so having said that, the philosophy is still design the process from the perspective of the customer and the add afterwards a control. Uh, most of the process I've seen is, they, especially when, when you allow the, the, the audit guys to design the process, they would design it around the control so it becomes a very inefficient type of process. No problem. That's a problem. Now, this is a very simple value added chart. So notice this is a process of uh, to make a bank deposit. So 10 minutes to the bank, waiting complete the transaction is your value added. Driving to the bank, waiting in line, driving home are the non-value added process. So only 4% of this process is value added. That's why uh, that's why when you do online transactions, especially when you have BPR or BBO, and I think even Union Bank, they have online app, they transfer funds, okay? You eliminate by, right away. You eliminate driving, waiting, and driving home. The completed transaction will be, completing the transaction will be just one minute. Okay. <coughs> Another one, tool that we use, <coughs> excuse me, another tool that we use for, for uh, detecting the waste <coughs> is a spaghetti chart. A spaghetti chart is, this is the layout of, I think this is a pantry, and this is a layout for uh, coffee making. It just traces the steps. So you notice you have one, number one, <coughs> from the coffee maker, it goes to the freezer, number two. From the freezer, it goes to the coffee grinder, three goes to the storage, goes to the coffee maker. Every time you make that jump, that is called transportation loss or motion loss. And you travel 58 feet. That, what does that mean? That's 58 feet of, uh, of waste. You can even convert that into time. You know, If that takes you, the whole process of traveling is 30 minutes. So it's 30 minutes of waste. So this is a very simple tool. You can actually use it right now, uh, especially if you're receiving. You know, I know, I know, I know embassies, customs, government. You know, anytime, 
uh, uh, they they would banking they would they would they they can use this right away you know look at your map trace the flow of the people and trace the flow of the paper if there's paper okay the people the paper and the service okay once you trace that service or product once you trade that trace that you'll be able to trace how much waste that you have okay what if you remove 20 percent of non-value added in your routine every day now th this is a more of a personal question for you you know uh today in in uh, in our quarantine ecq uh you would catch yourself doing non-value added stuff okay of course i'm not saying you don't never watch netflix i watch netflix too but in, during your so supposedly productive day you may want to look at branch out okay what were my activities what if i'm able to remove 20 minutes of non-value added activities a day that would add up to two weeks a year okay so you'll be able to uh, identify two weeks a year. Now, maybe just as a uh, let's let's have some uh, some participation. So I don't want you to be, to fall asleep in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> okay, can you indicate in your chat box what are the non-value added activities that you normally do in a day? Something that you want to reveal. Okay, just for the sake, can can you think about what were the non-value added processes? Probably in your work or in your personal life during this quarantine, what are the non-value added process uh, activities that you're that you're encountering right now? Okay, please don't be shy. Anybody? Yeah, in normal times we stuck in traffic. Oh yeah, we remove that. Uh, we remove that waste, right? So Zoom, aren't you glad for Zoom? Social media, yes, yes. I'm gonna talk about that for a while. There's a form that's a called task switching, uh, attention switching. Social media, watching TV, yes. Spending too much time on social media, right? Long travel time, yes. Okay. So I notice uh, watching TV, social media, long travel time. Actually, uh, one, although we were not happy with what's happening because there are a lot of people uh, suffering, uh, getting sick and all that. Uh, one of the silver linings is today is we're now uh, discovering how to uh, work more efficiently using online. There's some things that we can do online more efficiently, uh, so we so we don't have to travel. Some of you would travel more than two hours a day. Okay, I live in Alabang. Okay, so imagine if I have to go to Quezon City for some of my clients and Makati too. Uh, so that's that's a long travel time. Waking up late could be, yeah, could be. It's because of the momentum, taking long naps, okay. Although they say taking a short nap, 15 minutes during, during, you know, like break time would be good. That's not value adding, but it's a value enabling. But long, long naps, I agree. Comfort room time, yes, especially, yeah, several times a day. Probably you need to take some supplements if you have to go to the restroom all the time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your, uh, for your share, for your sharing. Just imagine if you can, if you can remove 20 minutes a day, that's two weeks a year. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit on the eight day deadly waste. I normally teach this during the, the class, but this is just a bonus for you. I mean, this one takeaway that I'd like you to, to, uh, to take with you when, when after this webinar, and you may want to identify the sort the, the types of ways that you will see. Okay, uh, it's it, I, I, there are many acronyms out there. There's wood, mint, timpy, wood, but I like to use the word downtime. This is the eight deadly waste downtime because it's easier to, to remember. Down D 
is defects, okay? Errors, overproduction is O. Producing more than what the customer needs. Waiting is waiting. You know, employees waiting, um, uh, uh, documents waiting, non-utilized talent, okay? When you're not utilizing the skills of your employees, transportation is moving from moving product or service from one product from one place to another that's transportation okay when you're moving the product from one uh one point to another another one is inventory inventory is building and uh storing extra services products uh motion is extra physical mental motion that does not add value okay extra processing is uh, ex uh, excess effort when customer does not require it. Okay, so let's move to each one. So when you talk about defects, it is order entry errors, design errors, engineering errors. Okay, mistakes, any type of mistakes, poor process controls, incorrect schedules and information, uh, lost, damaged goods. Managing subcontractors correct mistakes, extra people to inspect the work or repair. When you talk about overproduction, uh, purchasing items that before they are needed, you know you're 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 purchasing before they needed. Okay. Although you know inventory stockpiling, building ahead of schedule, that's a form of waste. Although right now you need to stockpile on PPEs because you need them right away. Unbalanced material flow or unbalanced process flow. You know, one, one process is faster than the other, so it's not balanced. So one guy is so busy, cannot leave at five o'clock, and the other guy is already relaxed, okay, at 12 o'clock because he's waiting because unbalanced flow. Unbalanced flow creates the creates two ways. Uh, creating Printing reports that no one needs, uses, or making extra copies. It's very common in offices. Okay, exceeding production plan that will lead to unnecessary working process, or un, un, you know, uh, work that that is not needed. Large batch sizes. Waiting is waiting for approvals, instructions, decisions. Person waiting for machine. Machine waiting for person. Equipment system downtime out of stock. Uh, you're waiting for the system because it's very slow or hanging up. Okay, not on internet for the internet. Seeking clarifications due to unclear communications. Uh, not utilizing people' experience, skills, knowledge, or creativity. You're not asking people for their suggestion. Okay, that's non-utilized talent. Uh, and you're utilizing somebody, let's say, somebody's like a IT guy, and you're utilizing him or her as a clerk. That's also non-utilized talent. A source of labor only, not seen as process experts. Yeah, you know, uh, one lesson I learned from the, the group I told you a while ago is those high school ladies, high school grad ladies, I mean, if you talk to them, they're very, they're very uh, confident because their bosses would ask them the problem because they treated them like process experts. Okay, Mara says when he purchase uh, uh, items ahead of time to buffer for stockpiling, is it still considered waste? That's a good, that's a good question. Depends on the demand of and the lead time. Okay, example, your PP is right now. Okay, PPs right now, I think the lead time is, I don't know, four weeks. If you have four weeks lead time and you know there's a demand, you need to, you need to, you need to react properly. What I'm talking about is when, you know, you buy one year supply of bond paper or, you know, open, you know, paper. And it will be, you know, it will take you one year to finish that up. That probably is not smart. That's waste. Okay, so I, I hope I answered your question. So there are two parameters you take into consideration. What is the demand and what is what is the lead time of when you purchase it? Maybe 
maybe you 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 know if the lead time for a certain for a certain product is six months, you probably will need to uh, uh, need to um, order accordingly. That's because of lead time. It's still waste, but it's necessary because of that reality. Okay, reality. Did I answer your question, Mara? Okay. Next. Uh, what else? Lack of pets. T is transportation, poor work layouts. So your, your product or service or documents will go around the place. Okay? So first you have it approved in first floor, then it goes to 10th floor, then it goes back to 7th floor, goes back to 3rd floor, goes back all the way up. Go, and in that it's called, from Makati, goes, that's a problem. Uh, double triple handling, excessive handovers of work. Okay. Okay. Good question, Martin Navarro. Sometimes organization purchase in bulk because of cost it would save. Is that considered waste? Yeah, it's still considered waste, but you have to look at the economics of it. Do you know that real estate is more expensive? Depends on what are you buying. If you're talking about paper. And it's gonna consume one room because it's like two months supply of paper. Do you know that real estate is more expensive than that item itself? So it's waste. Yeah, I got a 10% discount. Yeah. But but how big is that compared? Real, especially if you're in BGC, real estate in BGC is more expensive. Okay, depends on it will now depend on the economics. You have to look at the economics. Okay, but many times in my experience, they we were we're applying to our company the way we shop for clothes. We cannot apply how we shop for clothes in buying inventory. It doesn't mean it has a discount. You actually save more money, especially. Uh, the item you're buying is 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 not fast moving. Okay, by again, again, but, but we're talking about ball pens and all that, like school supplies. You don't want it to be too tight, such that when it runs out, somebody has to go to a national bookstore just to buy a pen. I'm saying every time you have more waste, more bulk purposes you have to be careful that's what i'm saying okay multiple storage locations inflexible conveying system suboptimal dispatching okay let's talk about inventory again inventory is extra materials working process unfinished work okay that's inventory or finished goods that are not being delivered low use uh low use to equipment ra ratios photocopiers Example, you have 10 photocopiers and you're actually just using two or three. So you're, the seven are underutilized, so that's a form of waste. Building, storing, extra products, poor inventory management system. These are for supply chain, okay, uh, inventory, retail, even manufacturing. They're using Philo. First in last out five. Or this goes back to the system and the layout. Emails waiting to be read. Okay. Files waiting to be worked on. Too many office supplies. Motion are searching for tools, for materials. Every time you're searching, yeah, it's waste. Okay. Uh, another form of waste is searching for information in your drive. Another form of waste is attention switching or context switching. I'm preparing my report right now. Then he chats me at the side, so I go back and chat back. Then I go back, then chat back. Then I go look at my email, okay, while my doing email. Oh, then, then somebody posted in Facebook. Oh, that's really nice. Like, okay. So there is a study in the States that out of the eight hours, working time, the effective working hours, continuous working hours for the average employee is 19 minutes. 
because of context switching or motion, mental motion waste because you're, you, you're working, then you're changed. You're working and that up and down, up and down momentum is the biggest waste today in the workplace. It used to be searching for stuff that is lost. Okay, but right now the biggest hidden weight is that lack of suboptimal standard operating procedures because it's not uh, standard reaching, bending, unnecessary ergonomics, okay, unnecessary walking, uh, handling of paper. Next, extra process. Higher, uh, providing higher quality than is necessary, like color printing. Do you need to really use brand new paper instead of like newsprint paper or recycled paper? Uh, unnecessary part system replacement, repeated manual entry of data, actually, especially for, for transactional. Uh, the rule is you want, only want to touch data once. No touch data. You don't want to want touch data. You want seamless from the source there. Every time you touch the data, it's waste. Extra processing. Okay, changing of format. It's Excel, then I have to change it because I have to upload to SAP. Okay, uh, redundant approvals. Gold plating over delivery. Okay. So quick question, could you, of all the ways I mentioned, what, do you, what, what struck you as the most common ways or a ways that is surprising to you, that, that is a waste? okay? I think Martin and Mara said something the same in the sense of stockpiling. Uh, I hope I answered your question. And any, any other forms of waste that you, you, uh, that, you uh, that I mentioned that is very common? or surprising to you. Okay. Ah, motion, switching attention, yeah. Be very common. That is why you may want to temper Facebook, and probably you, you don't like me, Facebook, social media unless your your work is social media marketing then that's a different story waiting for approvals for comments yeah context switching multitasking which we do a lot oh yes because multitasking I'm, you know you have to take this in context huh? sometimes multitasking is overrated you want to do single tasking very fast then switch that probably will be better double checking someone else's work right that is a waste. Agree, hundred percent. Searching for information. Okay. Frequent meetings. <laughs> okay. Okay, Cesar. I, I think that could be, especially long meetings. Actually, let, let me just go back. In meetings, you should have the 30, 70, 30 rule. What do you mean by that? 30% of the work can be done in meetings, but 70% of the work should be done outside the meetings. Unless this is a workshop, working workshop, you upfront say that. But normally, meetings should be 30, 70. Okay? Since the focus, customer is focused, is the focus isn't going beyond or getting the extra mile as extra. Wow, that's a really good question. Considered waste. Here, here's the thing. Uh, it's all about understanding what the customer wants. Uh, one, one example is this. Um, there was an IT company, IT guy, uh, that created a library program for a customer. And the customer said, what I want, a library, they, they wanted to track their books. Okay, I want, to, I want you to create me a system, simple system. The book is name of the book, name of the author, quantity of the book, ISF number, and yeah that that's it okay in this in this in this in this uh in this programmer wanted to go the extra mile so created a, a program okay so created the graphical user interface picture of the book and all the other and all the and all the the fields that the customer are required so he went to the customer on time okay which is good and he said uh, okay the customer said what is that oh that's what you asked for me here's the problem okay here's the problem uh, sabi niya. 
you know what what is that so that's the picture of the book and here's the fields yeah i like the fields but i don't like the picture of the book why isn't that great it's better yeah it looks better but i do not have budget to scan all the books see so that's called gold plating and at the same time you wasted the company's resources okay you know in as far you know in, in as far as that project is concerned now i'm not saying you're not going to go the extra mile you can go the extra mile for the customer but it goes back to okay understanding what do they really want what is really important to them okay because sometimes you you go the extra mile uh, as a matter of a good intention good attitude which is okay but but we need to be more diligent in really understanding what is the customer looking for and the, uh, on the other hand you also would like to look from a project management standpoint project managers will be good at this you only have limited resources you want to make sure that the resources that the resources and the allocation is spot on by making sense okay so you have to balance balance also mara said sharing information using shared drive seems common downtime especially during these times when you work remotely yeah yeah that is why you want to work with your it team to make it more efficient you share so there are certain tools that you can use to make it more efficient i think this has something to do also with the resource limitations that's right internet speed gadget and all that today you know if i were you uh i know you guys are you know most, most i'm a self-employed guy i have businesses i do a lot of online i i am fast fast internet okay I, you may want to consider that after this mm -hmm. having good internet connection is is a good uh, is a good investment not because it's better for netflix well it's, it's true but really when when you when we do things like this okay especially when you're in business you need to have internet because it could be uh, irritant okay and it's inefficient thank you for for sharing for, for participation so what it looks like traditional is work in batches and i'm not just talking about manufacturing i'm also talking about services uh lean, lean, lean is small batches it's just uh, um imagine the uh passport <laughs> example i did <coughs> excuse me <coughs> low <coughs> low low unit cost low system cost so traditional thinking <coughs> look at units cost unit costs in lean look at the total total cost that's why you were asking about <coughs> you were asking about bulk purchases in bulk purchases you're looking at the unit costs but when you talk at the total system cost it may not make sense <coughs> because it will it will introduce a lot of real estate okay and that, that may not make sense work at full capacity lean is about work at necessary capacity Traditional thinking is tight schedules. Lean is about flexible schedules. Traditional thinking is high work in process inventories, low inventories for lean. High level specialization in traditional. Lean is all about cross training. Long cycle times for, uh, for traditional, short cycle times in lean thinking. Lean is more of a ballet. Okay. Traditional is like it's like a hockey game where you have to work hard okay lean is about or orchestrating the whole thing now lean is really there too in in in, in uh, increasing your productivity okay in uh, in increasing your productivity there's a quantitative approach and the qualitative approach Okay, lean is about is a quali more qualitative approach, and it's not about working harder. It's about eliminating waste and simplifying it. So the, the lean is more really working smarter. 
So what it looks looks like is you know having a good workplace organization. We we introduce five S: sort, set, in order, shine, uh, standardize, sustain. Okay, it's really Japanese. Okay, but we, we translated it to English because uh, five S or workplace organization is the precursor for a lot of uh, a lot of the continuous improvement tools. One of the top time racers is looking for stuff that is is uh, is missing. Now, when maybe you say, "Oh, I have good work workplace." Okay, when I talk about workplace organization, it's not just the physical workplace organization. I'm also talking about the electronic workplace organization. You need to have good visual management, reduce clutter, and you the the acid test is the thirty second rule. If I ask for a file from you. Can you locate it and retrieve it in 30 seconds? Or at least locate it, okay? That is the 30 second rule. If you're looking for a file, physical file, you should be able to locate it in 30 seconds, okay? So any file at all, that is the magic of 5S. Because there's a lot of ways because of trying to look for stuff. That's the 30 second rule, okay? Just a... Uh, just a uh, census. Who among you guys will pass the 30 second rule? Or who among you guys will not pass the 30 second rule? I'm just curious. Not me. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your honesty. This is how Lynn looks like. I think I can. Wow. Wow, great. Done. So, 5S is about it's the third S is shine. It's literally shine. Okay. This is a warehouse. And, and more, more discernible place. Okay. Everything has a place where everything. Now, these are some of the levers, the seven levers of lean. I will not go through each other. You don't have much time. So this is about lean. Uh, lean will teach you how to segment complexity. Redistribute activities. Okay, there is a math, some mathematics that goes on. How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you break up your work work stages, work processes, such that you can meet the top time? Pool resources, you uh, utilize existing talents, having flexible manpower systems. Part of it is reducing incoming work, okay, and reducing non-value added work and having standardized operations. This is. These are the seven levers of lean that we normally would expand when we take up lean. Lean has visual management. It's all about metrics, scoreboards. So you can easily look with one look. You can, you know, what's the status of your process. Okay. And this applies to all types of processes. It could be finance, procurement, uh, supply chain, and manufacturing and retail. Lean has normally you would have you would have a visual management like uh, lights, okay, to give you the status so that the supervisor doesn't need to to go around and ask people what's going on. This could be physical light like this. It could be a tool in your PC, in your in your workstations, okay, in your computers. Normally we have tools like those. We have the high tech and the low tech version of of that. This is the lean framework. Okay, this is the house of lean. The foundation is stability, having standardized processes, standardized work. We have a planning system called Hey Junka and, and a, a uh, common mentality called Kaizen. We have two pillars, the just-in-time, where it is con uh, placed continuous flow, tack time, full system, flexible workforce. So there's a little bit of math here and and a little bit of process knowledge that you need to employ for you to uh, have just in time. Jidoka is a, a principle where in you separate man, work machine, you want to be able to empower your, your associates to be able to shut down the line and to highlight problems as they occur. There is also, uh, you want to be able to, to identify abnormality as they happen right away using visual management and you also have a term called pokayoke. Pokayoke means foolproofing. 
And the, the goal is really to have highest quality, lowest cost, short the sleep time, create value for the customer. So what the looks, looks like? Customer satisfaction, reduction in cost, uh, high profits, and 100% quality. So this is, this, the, and the great thing about Lean, it's a good starting point for everything. It's because you can, you know, once you know the concept, you can implement right away. Today, I gave you one concept called downtime, the eight ways. You can actually impl uh, apply it right away. Okay, there's a question here. Uh, given that there are several ways that exist in organization, what if the organization is willing to forego some of the inefficiency as the cost is probably made? Yeah, uh, again, it goes back to, again, it goes back, uh, James, to, uh, to economics, okay? You will have to understand the whole economics. But the, the idea of Lean is educating everybody on the concepts of Lean. Now, when everybody, everybody is educated and they knew the principles of lead, then they, it's up to them to make a decision, okay? Uh, in my experience, it's hard to have a zero waste, really. There is always some waste. And some, some of the waste you may have to uh, have a trade-off. And that's fine, okay? It's important. The important thing is don't look at just the unit cost. You want to look at the total cost, the total impact. That is the principle of it. Okay, I hope I understand. I ask I now. I want to go to Six Sigma, and we're gonna go. You know, now Six Sigma Lean really originated in the states, but perfected in Japan. Lean was was uh, originated in the in the US. Um, this is the history of continuous improvement. In the 1930s, it's all about testing, inspection, 60s, total quality control, uh, SQC. Then you have TQM. You have just in time. In the 80s, the six, actually, nine, technically, 1970, we had Six Sigma. Okay? Six Sigma was uh, invented in a company called Motorola. And in, uh, in, fortunately, 1985, I got hired in Motorola. That is where they, they really started to implement Six Sigma. So I... I, I, I saw it from all the early stages till it was uh, adopted by a lot of uh, companies like GE, okay? In year 2003, Six Sigma and Lean was integrated by, 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 the, by, the, um, by the continuous improvement uh, experts, okay? That's how it started. So now, today it's Lean Six Sigma continuous improvement that all towards uh, process now process uh, process uh, operation excellence now this is the this is a short description of how it came about in the 1980s i still remember this actually i do not know if i have the sorry i still remember this uh 1980s motorola art sundry our quality had said uh, our, our quality sticks and uh, it was around that time Motorola was number one in radio number two in semiconductors uh, eventually number one in by that time the, the cell phones were not yet there eventually we were number one cell phones and all that anyway to make the long story short uh, we were number two in semiconductors number one was Texas Instruments then the Japanese came in and all of a sudden, we dropped from number two to number four. By the way, the Motorola semiconductors today is on semiconductor. They, they, they span off. They're still, still, very do, do, still doing well. They actually bought a lot of company, quite a lot, AMI and uh, Fairchild. So they're doing, still very doing very well. And they have a strong Six Sigma program. Now, around that time, we created the four-point plan, global competitive part participative management, quality improvements. Here, they created a goal, nine, Six Sigma quality by 1992, okay? And uh, I asked them, what is Six Sigma? And they told me, oh, it's a uh, 3.4 defects per million. And the very first thought that came to my mind was, that's too much, <laughs> that's too much. That's so demanding, okay? Uh, and uh, 
little did I know, Six Sigma was more than a metric, which I'm going to discuss in a, a bit. And they, they came out with the Motorola Training Education Center, which became Motorola University, which became the center for Six Sigma uh, education. Not just for Motorola, but also the, the other companies. These guys, Will Smith, the father of Six Sigma, the co-inventor is Will Smith and, um, uh, and Michael Harry. Okay, now, but Will Smith was not even a manager. He was a senior engineer in an obscure failure analysis lab in Chicago. Here's the here's lesson from him. We had what you call a open door culture. Uh, our, the guy who was our CEO, his name is uh, Bob Galvin. He's the son of the founder and really good guy. And, and he's really more of a people person. And he said, uh, and his policy was people come first and open door policy and first name basis. Okay, so we are forbidden to call uh, anybody sir, boss, and all that. We, we call each other by our first names. That's why I normally call even very senior people by their first names because that, that's the culture I grew up with. The second is they, we open door policy. Anybody can go to the CEO's office anytime and take up. And one day he went into Bob's office and say, you know, Bob, every time our distribution, and this is a technical term, is plus minus six sigma uh, within the customer spec. We never had a customer complaint, never. And that started that discussion on variation and six sigma. Okay. Unfortunately, by the time, by the time uh, we, we were in full blown six sigma, Bill Smith passed away. Okay. Now, so this is the quick history of Six Sigma again. In the 1980s, we, we started Six Sigma. Our Texas instrument, our number one rival at that time, Intel was still number eight at that time, adopted Six Sigma. Uh, ABB, okay, saw the value of Six Sigma, actually eventually hired Michael Harry, okay. Michael Harry uh, developed the problem solving called MAIC. It was not the MAIC problem solving approach. Eventually, it transitioned to other companies. Actually, before MAIC, there was a, a, a process called MPCPS, Machine Process Capability Study. It has five stages, process characterization, metrology, capability determination, uh, process in, uh, optimization, then, and control. That was the foundation for MAIC. But before that, we even had AAIS, AI, 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 AAIS. It's uh, adherence, adhere to spec, analyze, improve, standardize. So the, the framework of Six Sigma, before it became the MAIC, which is Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, Control, it had its own transition. Okay. By the time in the eight, um, uh, Motorola won the Malcolm Baldrige Award and Bob Galvin introduced to a guy named Jack Welch, Six Sigma. He was skeptical, eventually Jack Welch embraced Six Sigma and that is the start of how Six Sigma had a lot of early adopters. Uh, top 500 Mac companies uh, claim to have a, a Lean Six Sigma methodology in place and had, they have black belts and belts in place in that. And today, Six Sigma has moved to other industries, not just manufacturing services. As early as the 80s, 90s, they were already doing services. That is why GE has a lot of uh, had shared services. They employed Six Sigma. And today, hotels, you know, a few months ago, I went to Vietnam and implemented Six Sigma for Lean Six Sigma for hospital group. Okay. I implemented Six Sigma in retail group. Uh, Six Sigma for payroll uh, and um, finance accounting and because and because Six Sigma deals with process improvement, reduction of variation and defects. So these are the top two guys in Six Sigma. Bob Galvin under whose watch uh, Motorola won the first Malcolm Baldrige Award and Six Sigma uh, was created. Jack Welch, which is the uh, He is known as the manager of the century. 
former CFG, uh, grew G by 1,000% and people asked him, how, how did you do it? He gave six reasons. I cannot name all six. And uh, first reason is uh, they will only operate in, in uh, markets there, number one, number two. Number two, they will have candor, okay? They will tell you straight if they want it or if, if you're doing a good job or not. Number three, differentiation. What is differentiation? They differentiate between the high flyers, the potentials, and the bottom 10%, okay? If you have in your company bottom 10% your performance appraisal, it's this guy's fault. <laughs> he introduced that. Reason number four was they implemented Six Sigma. Why? Because they said Six Sigma was a way for them to manage your business for, for strategy execution. It is also a uh, development tool for their managers. He, he actually required all managers to be black belt, Six Sigma black belts. Because once he's a Six Sigma black belt, he knows his manager can know how to look at data, can solve a problem, and can make data-driven decisions. Okay? That is the reason why. Now, these are some of the early adopters of Six Sigma G, obviously, PRW Automotive, Honeywell. Um, why do you need to implement Six Sigma? Because they've, uh, for early adopters, they've seen profit margins uh, grow 20% a year, either through cost savings or profit improvement. Uh, the return on average of per year for every black belt, Six Sigma black belt project is 230,000 US dollars, okay? Uh, which is fantastic, you know? That is why, that is why um, there's big demand for black belt certification or green belt certification because part of the part of the certification process is for them to complete the class of course obviously pass the exam and complete a project that is vetted by the company and the master black belt so what is six sigma six sigma is both a, is all a metric a methodology a management and its culture what do i mean by that metric it is it is a metric to measure process variation the metric standard is you are able to, you're, you're only producing 3.4 defects per million opportunities. What does that mean? For every 1 million invoices that you have, you only have 3 defective or 3 delays in those invoices. For every application that is processed, 1 million, okay? So that's the metric. Now, if you look at it, 99.5.9% performance means 400 lost males per hour. Six Sigma process is Six Sigma, where you know, is you have 500 incorrect surgical operations per week. 99.9, sorry. That is non-Six Sigma, 500 incorrect. Now, a Six Sigma process, you have 1.7 incorrect surgical operations per week. Safety perspective, airline. It's two, or, two long or short landings at major airports every day. Six Sigma is one long or short landings at every five years. By the way, the airline industry is about seven Sigma, which is better which is more than 10 years, you do not have any incidents. So if you have an airline that has an incident two times in a year, I'm not riding that airline, no matter what is the, what is the, uh, what is the cost, because they are an outlier, okay? 99.9% is 4,000 wrong drug prescriptions per year. So six sigma is 68 wrong drug prescriptions wrong drug prescriptions. Here's the thing. So if you have a hospital, say, ah, we're 99.9% .9 good. Okay. Well, you know what that does? That, that, that means you'll have 500 incorrect. <laughs> that the rate is 500 incorrect surgical operations per week. So 99%, that is not good enough. So historically, this is the Six Sigma uh, performance per, per, uh, per, for industry so airline safety is about seven sigma which is not bad payroll is at uh close to four four sigma okay 
baggage handling is different from airline safety. It's about 3.7 sigma. And I think you agree because you lose some of your baggage. Prescription writing is close to 3. Point, is 3 sigma. Okay. Restaurant bills is lower than 3 sigma. And the lowest one on record is IRS. Okay, this is in the US. So what is Six Sigma? Sigma is a letter in the Greek alphabet that is used in statistics to measure variability. It's called standard deviation. This is the formula for standard deviation. Okay, I will not ask you to memorize the formula. Even if you take my Six Sigma class, uh, the great thing about Six Sigma today is you have software. However, it's good to understand the formula. The formula is the square root of the variance known uh, of the variance is known as standard deviation. It is used to tell how measurements for a group are spread out from the mean. So you're looking at how, from relative to the mean or the average, how far are the data points from the mean? A low standard deviation means most numbers are very near. So you have lesser variation. The lower standard deviation, the better. That is why if your process has low standard deviation, you can go seven sigma and you don't go outside of the customer, uh, the customer preference or customer expects. Okay, six sigma is a metric. So if a pizza company fails to deliver versus the customer's delivery time, uh, the said performance can be translated into a sigma level. It means how many sigma, okay, x bar plus minus sigma can can uh, can you meet the the customer okay so in this case you have your upper spec limit if you look at the graph you have usl means upper spec limit okay that is the delivery that is the wind and the lower spec limit is the lower spec limit the upper spec limit the lower spec limit are is the window of delivery it means like plus minus 30 minutes right now if you notice the bell car the bell curve the bell curve is the performance of the pizza company. The dots that are outside, the red dots outside the upper spec limit or spec limit, means it meets that window. It could be it's okay. Outside means it's too early, not too late. Okay, upper spec outside of the lower spec, it's too early. So anything that is outside the window is called a defect. So if you're if it's a six sigma process, it means out of one million delivery opportunities you will have only three three uh three outside of that so what is a sigma level how much increments of sigma okay is within the up within the window the upper spec limit lower spec limit so the higher the sigma the better the better the performance because the higher sigma means your standard deviation is low when your standard deviation is low, it means your variation of your process is low. It means your process is more predictable. Very predictable process. So, so if you're a two sigma process, it's non-competitive, you're 69% good. Okay, three, three, per, three, three sigma is you have 93% good all the way up to six sigma. Now, if you're four sigma, you're above average, going to world class. If you're anything below three sigma, you're, you're below average. In six sigma, we, we uh, uh, cost of poor quality, okay? Uh, here's the thing. Anytime you have bad quality, you have defects, we work. You have already four ten percent of your sales that goes to waste but you don't know is underneath that you have more wastes that is the problem so having good quality is good business so the old traditional companies they look at quality or investment in quality as an expense well actually not no if you invest in Six Sigma, if you equip your people in essentially removing the 20-35% loss in sales and 40% loss in sales. Because in all operations, you have what you call hidden, 
hidden operations. Uh, the operations on the gray are on paper what are operations. Actually, underneath the scrap, the extra equipment, the rework are your hidden operations, your hidden factories that that actually gives you more, that gives you a lot of waste or it, cost, it would cost you more money. Now, Six Sigma is a methodology. It is the mind methodology. It's a continuous use of define, measure, analyze, improve, control methodology. It's a measurement-based process improvement analysis. It's team-based problem solving. Okay. So in essence, this is a methodology. Define means, you know, you're actually in define, you're actually looking at out of many potential projects, how what is a single project that I can work on will give me the highest impact. In measure, we're actually choosing where are we now, okay? Given the project, what is our current, cap current capability? Like when I, want, I wanted to lose weight, I was 211 pounds. The define is I need to lose weight in 90 days, okay? Measure is uh, measuring what is my actual performance, my actual weight, which is 211 pounds. It's the same thing. Measure is look at your process based time. This takes a little bit of time because some of your processes don't have metrics. Analyze is what what is what are the many potential causes. The root causes you want to identify the root causes. Improve is what is the solution. Improvements and test them. In analyze you're looking at the root causes. Okay, there are three types of root causes. There's the technical or specific root cause. There's what you call the systemic root cause. And the last one is the detection root cause or escape root cause. And after finding the root cause, you can now solve the problem because you found the root cause. That's improved. Control is creating and institutionalizing the process. So, so these are the different tasks for the DMI process. I won't go to each one, it's gonna to be too long, but just, just an overview. You identify the opportunities in define, determine capability measure, investigate the causes and analyze, find solutions and sustain improvement. Now, typically in the define stage, it is the sponsor, the executive or the champions that identify the projects. Or sometimes the, the guys, the green and the black belts, for the project or not part of what's important so you want to make sure that what you're working on is important is aligned to the strategic uh, plans of the company and the, the even the operation plans of your of your superiors now the belts would not will do the maic Next, Six Sigma is a management system. It is a uh, strategy execution uh, uh, framework. It has a structure, champions, black belts, green belts, and teams, okay? Actually, when we started this in Motorola, there were no belts. We just had tools, okay? But this one became a whole framework. Uh, processes, it has process of you have a go governance process, project selection, tracking, and review. We also have uh, toll gate reviews. You have metrics driven and organization wide deployment. So, this is the roles of in Six Sigma. Senior management would approach from a strategic standpoint. The skills they know is the, um, some of the executive skills in DMAIC. Middle management no, normally focus on dashboards of processes and normally they would need process mapping skills, redesign skills, data analysis skills. Process owners, these are the black belts, okay, green belts. Their approach is uh, process improvement, whether incremental or, or, uh, or breakthrough process improvements. So part of their process is their, their, the the mind process uh, knowledge, the belt knowledge, they need also to have some project management skills and team facilitation skills. 
So if you notice, a belt, a black belt or green belt should have both hard skills and soft skills. They need to know how to manage a team at the same time, they need to also know how to manage your stakeholders. So we and have some change management tools in place outside of the statistical tools and problem solving tools that we will teach them. These are some of the, these are the players, key players for six, these are the belts, Six Sigma belts. So champions are the ones who will support the project teams. These are normally executive, part of the executive team that selects a project. The black belts are the one working on the big projects, okay, and oversee some of the green belts. The green belts are working on the incremental projects. Some of these projects may be also part of the black belt project, which is possible. Some, it could be a standalone as well. Yellow belts, on the other hand, are very key. This guys are, should be equipped in process mapping, some value stream mapping, initial process characterization. They also need, need to know basic problem solving. Okay. So the typical black belt requires 46 black belt project. A typical black belt project can, can take 46 months for complete, uh, to complete the project. And the average return for a black belt project is $185,000. So, so you also have green belts. So green, green belts, a little bit less than 100, about 50 to 100 will be a green belt. And the yellow belts will participate in the projects. The annual benefit of, annual benefit of a black belt should exceed 500,000 because a black belt should be able to work on four to six projects in a year. So if I were you, if going to train your people, you need to have them certified why is that because it is very it is very seldom that uh, people will have them certified with a diff you know they train with one entity then they will have them certified in another entity that's very rare you want to be able to train and certify the same entity why is it that because the common problem of employers are this right? training they pass the exam and they need to they need to uh, complete a project and normally the project will be more than a hundred thousand US so you by the time and even if and even if they if they leave after their certification you know that's that's too bad but not as bad because by the time they would have paid off already the, the, uh, the, the cost of their training and more because they've already delivered on the project. Okay? So typically that's, that's the key. Now, and, and, and if I were the person who's undergoing the trainer certification, I will not leave if, if uh, I'm, I'm undergoing training or certification because uh, Six Sigma certification, Lean Six Sigma certification is a big deal. 30 to 50 percent of managers would require right now a, a Six Sigma, a type of a Six Sigma training or certification. Okay, so that's, that's the key. So what's a Six Sigma? If I have to just, just choose one word, it's culture. It's a way of type, way of thinking. It's embedded in your DNA. The vision is operational excellence. So the integration of Lean and Six Sigma happened in 2003. As they matured, okay. Um, I was just fortunate that you know in nine, uh, I eighty five I, I started off in Motorola. Uh, after thirty years, I went from one company to another. Then I I went to other companies that were more centric in lean, uh, single piece flow, and there were companies that had a mixture of both. Uh, in Motorola, we had a competition every year when I was there. Every year, 4,000 teams worldwide would compete for eight gold medals uh, in a Six Sigma competition. We called it Total Customer Satisfaction Competition. Uh, there was one country that has won the five, cons five consecutive uh, gold medals. This was in the 1990s, uh, uh, way back when the Chicago Bulls were winning championships. We were winning with them. Actually, there was only one country that won the gold five consecutive years. It was the Philippines. Okay, and except for the T 
team that I coached, the fourth team that was an all engineering team, the the four other teams that that were that got the gold uh, were mostly were high high school graduates, the the members. Of course, they had a green or black belt equivalent with them, but it was it was a it it goes to prove that you do not need you do not need high tech or high statistics to have uh, good performance. I was also fortunate to get to get involved with the at least four of those teams that won the gold. Uh, I was impressed with the with the, the the guys that had no supervisors. Those that team, uh, it was an all operator team. The culture of that team was unbelievable. That became the the prototype on how we grew the culture of our organization. Uh, when we went, when we were talking about operational excellence. One of the key pillars of operational excellence was high-powered teams. The pillar for high-powered teams is small team problem solving. Okay, so that's one. So Lean Six Sigma as a system is in, is a combination of management system, methodology, tools, and metrics and goals. It's a way of life to improve the profitability of a company. So this one is just a chart. It's a busy chart, by the way. It shows here if you only use Six Sigma, you, the tendency is for you to improve the defect rates and the variability, but somehow you will lose the, 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 the speed. However, if you use Lean, you will be able to speed up your process, but you're not necessarily going to improve your, your, your uh, defect rates or your quality. So you want to use both Lean Six Sigma. Lean improves the flow by eliminating waste. By combining Lean Six Sigma results into smooth, steady flow. And this is the integrated uh, process of Lean Six Sigma. Okay, in, in Lean, you're, you, you're using Lean for reduction of cycle time, ability to improve the processes, analysis, uh, analysis of layout. Six Sigma looks at variation of reduction, data-driven strategy, statistical relationships between, between outcome and the process and the leading lagging indicators and understanding uh, measurements in variation, uh, variation measurements. So today Lean Six Sigma is being used uh, in, you know, in manufacturing process industries and services. And these are the toolbox of Lean Six Go very fast. This is Define. In Define, you will, we will, you will study the how to create a business case, create a project charter, and do initial process mapping. Measure will deal with process mapping, identification of your process capability, looking at your data, and looking at trends of your data, and what it tells you. Uh, it also looks at uh, validation of me measurement systems and the effectiveness of your inspection process or your judgment process. Of course, your data collection plan is there. In analyze, you will be using problem solving tools like your classical Ishikawa diagram, but you will also look, look at a lot of uh, statistical tools and how to solve day one and day one problems. We will in, improve, you still use statistics, but you will use generation of solutions, select solution. Uh, between measure and analyze and improve, we will use what you call a very powerful tool called FMA, which is failure, failure mode effect analysis, which is a uh, risk assessment tool and anticipating what could go wrong. Uh, FMA is a very powerful tool to, uh, to uh, prevent Murphy's Law, to advise Murphy's Law. And of course, run pilot and plan implementation. In control, we will talk about a little bit about standardization documentation, having a what you call a control plan, statistical process control, how do you uh, change management, evaluation, uh, and how to close projects. This is the organization for Lean. In Lean Six Sigma, for it to be successful, you need the participation of the executives, the champions, especially in identification what, what projects are worthwhile, HR team, and all that. These are the levels of implementation. These are this is the maturity levels of Six Sigma. Level one is launch, early success, scale and replication, institutionalization, and culture transformation. This is the uh, 
maturity model of a Lean Six Sigma. Typically, a launch would take you three to nine months. That is when the training start. Six to 18 months, you'll have early successes. It could be earlier than that. There's a little bit of overlap. Then you will have scale replication 12 to 36 months. You'll be able to institutionalize, institutionalize everything in 24 to two years, uh, 24 to 48 months. And eventually, Okay, with that limited seating, we'll have a green belt, uh, green belt programs, uh, training certification for the month of May. I think it's uh, every Monday and two selected Thursdays, okay, half day, but the Mondays will be whole days. Anyway, with that, uh, this is a uh, Please contact us. You can copy this uh, to the Phoenix One website. And I'd like to thank you all for, for your participation and for, for coming over. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions so far? Thank you. Okay. Now, okay, um, any questions so far? You can uh, place in your chat box. Or if you want to unmute yourself, I'll... Okay, are there no questions? Okay, uh, are slides available on Phoenix One? I'll have to could, uh, I'll have to uh, I'll have to ask Phoenix One uh, on, on that one. Uh, that's not normally my uh, my practice, but uh, uh, I'll talk to uh, to Phoenix One on that one. Okay, please contact them. Thank thank you very much. Okay.